Hello, guys. My name is Peter de Bruges. I'm chief film critic of Variety. Uh, Jean-Pierre Melville is my favorite filmmaker, and it's a real honor for me to uh, moderate this uh, conversation. Uh, we have two of Melville's living nephews, uh, Remy Grumbach and Laurent Grousset. Both of them have worked with their uncle, Jean-Pierre Melville, and both of them went on to become filmmakers themselves. Uh, we're going to speak a little bit about Melville's legacy, his strange uh, habits and, and signatures. But uh, I just want to give you a quick taste of kind of why Melville, I think, is such an important filmmaker who's only really just being appreciated in recent years for his legacy. He's someone who uh, was independent in France at a time when the, uh, the French film industry was still very much run by... Uh, by the studios, by uh, you, you couldn't kind of break in. You had to work your way up from an assistant. And he uh, was very interested. He was enamored with the movies, very interested in making them himself. Uh, himself and he created a, a an entire apparatus outside the system. So what Melville accomplished making his early films sort of paved the way for what we think of as the French New Wave. His example and his independence showed them that they could grab small cameras and go out into the streets and do films themselves. So uh, they often, you can see it, Melville makes a cameo in Breathless, the um, Jean-Luc Godard film, which is kind of an homage from one generation to uh, their forebear. But uh, the other thing I think that's really exciting and interesting about Melville is he looked to American cinema. He kind of absorbed all of the codes of crime films and genre films and uh, brought his own sensibility, his own kind of French uh, uh, way of thinking to them. And I think in some ways made that genre, the kind of film noir, the, the crime film, spy stories, he elevated it in a way that kind of reached its perfection uh, in this kind of melding of a, a French artistic sensibility and the genre codes before. And in some ways that is a nice transition to uh, Le Deuxième Souf, which I think in some ways is maybe the best example of this. It's a film very much inspired by a, the American directors and American genre films that he loved. Uh, I'm going to turn over the Q&A now to our two guests, but Laurent, would, uh, can you elaborate a little bit on, you know, this, this idea of who do you think the influences or, or what was it that Melville was really uh, inspired by in making a film like Le Deuxième Souffle? Well, <clears throat> first of all, Jean-Pierre was in love, what we call in French, le milieu. The milieu in French is where all the bad people are, you know, the, the crooks, the whatever they are. And he had many friends there. And I remember going with him and Rémi as well to have a drink with some of those bad guys, you know. But all the gangsters in his films are not real. He, he made it very clear, I love gangsters, but my gangsters had nothing to do with the real ones. And I think this is quite important. But he, he was friendly with, uh, one thing that's interesting is uh, he had friends on both sides of the law and in some ways had a, a sensibility of kind of the difference between the good guys and the bad guys was a, a sort of, uh, that wasn't something that he bought into philosophically. He seemed to sort of have a respect uh, for the criminal underworld as much as for the codes of law enforcement. Is that fair? Completely. He had friends on both sides, you know, the good one and the bad ones. And as you say, was re respecting them absolutely. Definitely. It's a theme you can see throughout Melville's films, these kinds of, it's really almost more about the codes between men, the codes of honor. And uh, that in, in a way you can have that code can be broken by a policeman who's not being true to his word or who's... Uh, dirty and you can have a criminal who actually is the the person that he has the most respect for because of as in le doulos uh you know the a criminal who kind of uh makes a sacrifice for a higher um you know a higher calling or a higher honor l'acteur qu'il avait pris pour bob le flambeur qui est un de ses premiers films so the actor uh remy is talking about the the lead actor in the film bob le flambeur Go ahead. L'acteur s'appelait Duchesne. Roger Duchesne. Et Roger Duchesne faisait partie du milieu. 
non seulement il avait été collabo pendant la guerre, mais en plus, il avait été emprisonné à la santé parce qu'il faisait partie du milieu. Et deux jours avant le tournage du film, Jean-Pierre est allé le chercher à la prison de la santé où on le libérait. Et c'est extraordinaire parce qu'il y avait simplement un ou deux journalistes qui étaient au courant, mais ça avait fait la couverture à l'époque de François ou du Figaro, je ne me souviens plus. Mais Roger Duchesne était un ami, un vrai ami de Jean-Pierre, et c'était un mec qui faisait partie du milieu. So uh, Roger Duchesne, the, the lead actor, Bob and Bob Le Flambeur, is someone who comes out of the milieu, who himself was part of the criminal underworld. And in order to shoot the film, Remy says, uh, uh, Jean-Pierre had to go and collect Roger from the, uh, from the prison where he had just been let out a couple of days before. I was talking about the codes that Jean-Pierre had for the good one, the bad one. Most of that came from his war experience. Mm -hmm. This is where he met people, he felt people, you know, and all the codes he gave to, to to his actors later on, lots of things come from the war the war period. Interesting. It's it's important for people interested in uh, Melville's biography to understand that he he served uh, France in the war. I think he served in England at one point. Is that right? Well, first of all, Jean Pierre um, was doing his military service when the war starts. Okay. Okay. And then um, when. The war starts, he joined the army. And in 1940, when Pétain, you know, stopped the war through the armistice, he joined the resistance. And he was based in Castres. I remember he was living with us. And Castres is where the prison of, of uh, Deuxième Souffle is, actually. He chose this prison to shoot the Deuxième Souffle many years afterwards. And after this, about two years of resistance, he decided to put the uniform again and join the goal. It's and so join uh, the goal. Uh, that that's important for those who are interested in Melville's uh, uh, oeuvre, his his filmography, because uh, you can see L'Armée des Hommes, the Army of Shadows, which is a film that was discovered by Americans quite late. It wasn't released until the early 2000s here, but it was so beloved by critics and by the audiences. It actually won sort of the Village Voice poll, its number one film of the year, even though it had actually been uh, originally made in 1967. But uh, Armée des Hommes is inspired by Melville's own you know, service and experience with the resistance. Uh, and uh, it's it's very close to his uh, his heart, even though, uh, you know, other films are less autobiographical, but I think all of them show very much, they reflect his philosophy, almost like a, a, a kind of um, a sense of what, um, what his belief in mankind and kind of what um, values he appreciated. And in Deuxième Souf, we see that as well. I think we see the dynamics you can watch for between characters reflect uh, his values. It started in 1966, I think, produced by the Lombroso with Simon Signore in the film. And the producer got bankrupt, didn't pay anybody. I remember because then me and I, we were second assistants on that version. And uh, the film started again three months later with Lombroso's brother and Christine Fabregas instead of Simon Signore and a few changes in the in the cast as well. But that's how it started and a bad moment. <laughs> uh, so uh, th this was the film on which our two guests both had a chance to work with their uncle. And uh, you've told me at other times that um, uh, he really did not help uh, your to support your careers in a way you got to observe him uh, on this sort of failed first attempt at making Le Deuxième Souf. But after that, it was more about what you could learn from watching him and then having to sort of create your careers on your own, basically. Completely. No, Jean-Pierre, after that, didn't help us, nor Remy or me. But we had him and we knew him very well. We were very, very close to him, very close. So that's helped as well. But there is something important I think people should remember about Jean-Pierre. Jean-Pierre, after the war, came back to 
to, to the normal civil life without a dime, nothing, having seen hundreds of films, mostly Americans, never had put a step on a, on a set and he decided he was going to be a, a director, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. And that's when he's, uh, he did a short film uh, um, called 24 Heures de la Vie d'un Clown, a very short film. A Day in and the then, Life of a Clown, I think, in English. Yeah. And then he decided to shoot Le Silence de la Mer, which he had read during the war. So for that, he went to see the... The writer to ask him for the rights, and and Vircor said, "Okay, fine. What have you done?" And Jean Pierre said, "Nothing." It was you know he hadn't even put a foot on the set. Yeah. And and Vircor said, "I'm very sorry, but in that case, no way." And then something happened. Jean Pierre told him, "Monsieur Vircor, I am going to do your film whether you want it or not, but if you don't like it, at the end." I will promise I will burn the negative. And wow. I think this is an incredible story, you know, of a young man, completely virgin, for shooting a film, saying that, and he did it, and the film was successful at the beginning. Melville was an incredibly hard headed director, and this obviously contributed to his ability to launch a career outside of the industry. But it was also something that caused friction with a number of his lead actors. And um, there's he worked with Jean-Pierre Belmondo on a number of early uh, films together until such a point as the two of them got into a fist fight and the uh, yeah. relationship between them ended. Uh, Lino Ventura sort of takes over for the next period as sort of being his leading man until Le Deuxième Souf. And then after that, there's a collaboration with Alain Delon uh, in later films. But uh, Laurent, to sort of wrap us up, could you tell us the story? Because I think it's so, uh, it says so much about the kind of filmmaker he was, the kind of personality he was, but about the falling out with Lino on this movie. I mean, he had a fight with Lino on the Deuxième Souf when he shot, a, a, you know, on a train and Lino was supposed to go on that train moving slowly. And Lino said to Jean-Pierre, I want the train going to that speed, no more. Jean-Pierre said, of course, no problem. No problem. But the train went much faster. And Lino was furious. And strangely enough, when they did La Médison, much, much later after that, they didn't talk. They didn't speak together. And the relationship between the, the, the director and the, and the actor was to say to the assistant, could you please tell Mr. Ventura to put his hand? And the assistant would say, Mr. Ventura, Mr. Melville asked you to put his hand. You know, things like that, which is incredible. So you have them standing within, uh, they can hear one another, but the, at this point it had been, it, the break had been so severe that uh, they insisted on this go-between to sort of play moderator for anything one said to the other. Yeah, completely. Il y a quelque chose de très intéressant, c'est que, Lino Ventura pour gêner Jean-Pierre pour ne pas lui faciliter la, cha la chose voulait regarder chaque soir les rushs alors que Jean-Pierre ne voulait personne à côté de lui voulait être le seul à les voir avec sa script So et... uh, I'll translate and then you can continue uh, in order to annoy Jean-Pierre uh, Lino insisted on watching the rushes every night and this is something that uh, Melville was, it was adamant about. No one but him would be able to watch the rushes, but it was in Lino's contract and he insisted. Ordinaire, c'est que les deux hommes étaient tous les deux, regardaient tous les deux, ne se parlaient pas, mais regardaient tous les deux les rushes et prouvaient leur accord par des regards. C'est-à-dire que Lino adorait ce que faisait Jean-Pierre et il le faisait ressentir, mais il n'y avait pas besoin de traduction c'est-à-dire de traduction de, de paroles entre eux, euh, ils s'appréciaient énormément. Et Jean-Pierre a toujours apprécié, toujours, Lino Ventura. Mais je ne suis pas certain, parce que moi j'ai travaillé avec Lino Ventura, et jamais Lino Ventura m'a dit la moindre chose gentille, le moindre compliment vis-à-vis -vis de Jean-Pierre. Il avait un ressentiment 
très bizarre vis-à-vis -vis de Jean-Pierre. So, uh, despite the fact that they had this falling out, they really did uh, have have they appreciated one another's sensibilities and and the way that each of each other uh, each worked. So Lino uh, really did have an admiration for uh, Jean Pierre, but uh, despite this, um, that didn't stop the uh, the personal sort of uh, conflict between them. And he went even further because during the edi editing of, of the film. By contract, Lino you know, was supposed to be able to assist Jean Pierre to the editing. And there was something Jean Pierre hated it, if that. So he took his editing machine to his private home in the country to be quiet and be able to edit without Lino. Uh, so, that, that's great. It's, it's something where Lino was a big enough star that he basically had the equivalent of an American actor kind of like approval. And you're 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 explaining that. Uh, this was kind of how Melville worked around it. Go ahead, uh, finish up uh, your thought. And there's something else, which Remy, if you remember, when Jean-Pierre died, Lino sent a rose. Well, uh, I hope that the audience here takes the opportunity of tonight's screening as sort of a, a first taste of, of Melville's uh, legacy. There's quite a few other films that are worth discovering. He's also inspired others. This Actually, Le Deuxième Souffle was later remade by Alain Corneau with uh, uh, quite recently in the last 10 years uh, or 15 years by um, uh, with uh, uh, kind of almost like bright De Palma colors. But um, this is really, I think, getting to see Melville in his film noir mode and uh, the way that he brought film noir to France. Um, but uh, take this as an invitation to to dive deeper and discover his other films, which we'll be screening uh, over the next nights, and many of them are available through the Criterion Collection. Uh, thank you both for uh, joining us and for sharing your stories and memories. You're welcome, absolutely. And enjoy the film. Merci beaucoup, Peter. <laughs>